Bingo, we're back. The 2.30 rock, if you will. I'm Jay Fidel here on the first broadcast day of the new year. Uh, we're doing Community Matters, our show about the community. And uh, we have uh, my co-host is uh, Raya Salter. Um, she's an energy attorney, but she's also a person who follows things in the community. Uh, and then we have our special guest, uh, Curtis Kropar, and he is the CEO of HawaiianHope.org. Uh, these guys were doing a show just last hour, and then we, we had time in the salon together. That's our reception area here in the ThinkTech studio. And we started to talk about a new issue, and I thought it's worth having a show about this issue. So we're going to put this in the container of Community Matters. This issue relates to a new, a new uh, state homeless law that I think you'll really hate. Uh, you know, the state of Hawaii has a major homeless problem. We probably have the highest per capita uh, mm -hmm. homeless uh, for, of any state. Mm -hmm. And it's very sad and tragic. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, you know, do we recognize how serious it is? Are we doing enough to take care of it? Um, or are we just going with the flow here? And, and is it just happening worse? And I think it's probably happening worse. And the question is whether the steps we are taking are useless uh, or useful. And uh, in this case, I think we, we found one step, uh, which has become effective as a new statute on, what, uh, January 1st, which is basically useless and uh, destructive to the effort to help the homeless. And in fact, there was an article about this in the Wall Street Journal, the national uh, examination of it, about Hawaii's troubles with the homeless and its inability to solve the homeless and its, um, its uh, ability to have a really crashingly bad statute and set of regulations here in Hawaii. So let's explore that. Uh, why don't you give a little background on this, Raya, and uh, tell everybody what's happening and what was in the Wall Street Journal just Monday. Well, according, according to the Wall Street Journal, um, a new law was um, allowed to take into effect that um, substantially changes the regulations that apply to homeless shelters. Um, specifically, they um, change the requirements for square footage and other um, types of upgrades that the shelters would need to have. Um, and according, again, according to the Wall Street Journal, it is due to complaints from um, from folks who clients of shelters who were would like you mean to mean homeless see, people who are in shelters. Yes, they homeless, don't like the shelters. Yes, that they are not as safe or comfortable as they could potentially be. However, um, also according to the Wall Street Journal, um, these regulations will require the type of upgrades that um, shelters in the state will not uh, ultimately be able to comply with, and it is anticipated that there may be a 33% drop in available beds um, in, uh, uh, for the homeless population in the state. So let's look at the syllogism of it. So some of the people in the shelters don't like the shelters. They're not happy with the shelters. They want better living quarters in the shelters, even though the idea of a shelter is temporary. It's not long term, not supposed to be long term. <clears throat> and then the state, in order to resolve that problem, the state orders that all these shelter operators, they got to build partitions and uh, make, make better facilities in the shelters, but they don't, they don't uh, actually appropriate one farthing to help them do that. They're on their own to find the money to do what the state is now ordering them to do. And let me go a step further. Um, because they don't, the, the shelters don't have the money, they're going to have to cut the number of homeless beds in their homeless facilities. Do I have it right so far? That's, that sounds like at least how it was reported in the, in the Wall Street Journal on New Year's Day. Yeah, so, so uh, a, a statute and regulations that are supposed to help the effort to help the homeless actually has the effect of reducing uh, the beds available to the homeless in the shelters. Wow, what a great result right out of the box here on the basically the effective data of the bill. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I guess that's not a very happy picture, Russ, uh, Curtis. Um, tell us what's happening from your point of view, because you do follow this. You're, you're, <clears throat> you're, you're, you have the data to tell us who's in the shelters and uh, what the, you know, the demographics are and how they're yeah. affected. Um, so part of, part of what uh, our organization does is we, we design software and we actually manage some of the data for several of these shelters. And, um, you know, we keep hearing constantly people saying that, oh, people don't want to go to the shelters. Uh, well, we can, we can show you for a fact that several of these shelters have a waiting list to get in. Um, like many months. 
just it, to get it, in. At least one of the shelters we work with, they have almost a three-month waiting list to get into the shelter. And meantime, they're in the street because nobody's taking care of them. Well, right. There's no place else to go. There's no place else to go. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I mean, that's, that's just a fact. So that flies got... in the face of this notion about how they don't want to be there. Right. Right. Um, and there, you know, there are a number of reasons. It's not just, you know, everybody I keep hearing, oh, they don't like the rules. Um, well, there's different reasons for those. There's different rules that, you know, are, are the problem. Um, and, and now we've just created uh, several more that will exacerbate the, you know, it's just going to exponentially make the problem worse. Yeah, so tell us what, you know, how, how this is supposed to be playing out in the shelters and how the shelters react to it. Well, um, my understanding is there's three different, um, there's three different components of this. Um, the first component is that the facilities are supposed to be made safer. There's more physical space. They, I think the requirement is now 30 square feet per person uh, at the shelter. So where shelters used to have beds, uh, you know, side by side, now they've got to spread them out. They're supposed to put partitions up. Um, the thing is, for some of these shelters, it's just one big open room. Um, and so... You know, when I went to uh, Europe right after law school, I, I spent my time in youth hostels. Mm. Uh, youth hostel was a great big room yeah. um, with multiple, with beds with multiple tiers, you know, double decker, triple yeah. decker beds. Mm -hmm. and, and they were, you know, a foot or two away from the next bed and the whole room was full of that. Um, and then we ate together and, um, and we talked together and we had a wonderful time actually. And there was nothing wrong with having these beds a foot or two apart and having, you know, because the, the alternative for us, we didn't have any money was to be out on the street sleeping, you know, right. on the bridge. Well, Jet, let me say, I have also had wonderful times in European youth hostels. Um, and not to be in defense necessarily of the changes, but I do think that um, comfort and privacy and dignity and safety for people in homeless shelters is an important issue. Yeah. Um, I think perhaps because, uh, you know, having a lot of experience in New York where shelters can be very, very dangerous. Um, it, it is an important issue. So okay. that how is my dangerous point. are these shelters? You talked about safety, right? Mm -hmm. And I like to know how dangerous are they? Well, in New York, they'd be more dangerous, <laughs> I think, actually. Right. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, well, you know, it, it's when, when you think of safety, it's not just that you know somebody's going to like reach over and beat you up or something like that. Um, it, it could be anything. It um, you know some people they're just paranoid of anybody too close to them. You know, hey, you're too close. I don't want you. You know, you're always looking at my stuff, you're looking at my business, you're, you know, it, it, it's, it's more about just physical, personal space, you know. So that is part of it. It's, it's, um, it, it's not necessarily that, you know, there's people getting in fights at the shelters, because if that was the case, I'm sure we would see the news every single day where the police or the ambulance or somebody's at the shelter and they're taking people away or, you know, something. It, it's not happening, you know. And so they are relatively safe. They're safe. It's a space thing. It's a, it's a comfort it's, it's thing. It's a yeah. comfort thing. Yeah. This is a big issue. And, and it, but she, you know, Rai is right. Is it? It is something that we need to address. It needs to be addressed. That you know, certain people they they need to have space. You got families with kids who are living at the shelters. You need more physical space, right? Um, but I think we took this in a step like way overboard because now we're mandating it for the entire facility. You know, for everybody who's in the facility, and the ultimate response is okay. If if you have a building that's all many that is only so many square feet to begin with, and now you're saying you have to allocate x many square feet per person, well, it's a simple math formula. Okay, well, that means that I can only fit so many people into the building now. You know, and so a, a, a shelter. You know, there's several of them who've been in the news recently talking about this. If if you've got you know, 300 people in a building um, that require 30 square feet each, you just reduce the capability of, of housing 100 people. So, uh, okay, uh, so um, that means that they have to go out, they have to leave now. I, mm. I'd assume so, I mean, what else, you know? Well, you can't not comply with the law, right? right? I mean, they, I suppose they could refuse to comply with the law, um, and well, uh, leave them in there and let the, and let the police throw them out. I, but I, that doesn't sound like a great idea here in no. the United States. And, and that's only one of the issues. That, you know, I mean, the, the physical space requirement is only one of the issues. Um, the, the second issue of this is that um, the, the shelter programs 
they were uh, basically two-year programs. Once you move into a shelter, move into the, the system, uh, you got two years to get yourself together. Okay. Is that an adequate amount of time? Even that's, no, it's too short. Um, is that happening or, it, are you, yes. now you have the data, so we, we have can some you tell us, do they actually leave in, at the end of two years or oh, are they staying no, no, no. longer? We, we've, we see people who move out within six months. They, mm. they get everything put together, they do, you know, what they need to. I mean, there's some people in different circumstances. Every, you know, every story is different. Um, I've, I know for a fact, I've met people, they've lived in Hawaii all their lives, right? But they were born in California. Um, and I didn't even believe it myself, but I called to confirm. California has a 12 to 20 week waiting period for a copy of your birth certificate. So if you don't have your birth certificate and you are required to get it, you may have to wait 12 weeks just to get a copy of it before you can get your ID, before you can get a bank account, before you can get a job. Welcome to the high tech of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I said, I didn't believe that. So I actually wrote an email to California and, you know, <laughs> their director responded back, dear Mr. Crowbar. You know, I said, you know, hey, what, you know, here's our clients telling me this and I don't believe them. I, tell me really what's happening because I want to set this guy straight. And he said, well, dear Mr. Crowbar, uh, unfortunately your client is correct. It's 12 to 20 week. Um, so, this, so it makes it harder for the homeless person to get settled right. and organized and, and get another place and get a job for that right. matter. Right. And now we're saying that, well, you can't do it in two years. You can't do it in six months. It's 90 days. You have 90 days. I, th I think that's what the new rule is, that they, they, they want 50% of the people who come into the programs to be housed in permanent housing in 90 days. Okay. Even if we can get them their birth certificate and their social security card and their, all their documentation and all the paperwork and all their, for the, for the COFA participants, their I-94s and all these paperwork, even we can do all that, right? And we magically get them, uh, you know, a job and, and payroll and, or, or benefits or whatever. We get all this stuff done. Where are they going to go? There's no, I mean, that's part of the problem. Yeah, There's no housing. Like, yeah, I have to say, because it's like, even if I can see sort of like, not having a two-year requirement simply for the sake of paperwork. I mean, that maybe doesn't make any sense. However, the real issue is the lack of affordable housing. Right, just, right. I mean, we've got people, you know, sorry, and I'm not complaining about this. It's an observation. We've got people who have been living in public housing for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, two, three generations. And why? It's because there's no place else to go. They can't afford, they can't afford anything else. Yeah, yeah. Before we go to the break, I just want to ask you one thing that came up in our earlier discussion, too, and that is, some of these shelters, because of these rules, have indicated they'll have to close. Is that right? Uh, at least one so far, yes. Um, they've, they've, they didn't even bother filling, filing the applications because they, they knew from the get-go there's no way they can comply with the rules. So they've already announced they're closing. Um, That's really sad. Thoughts about that, Raya? Well, it's, it's extremely sad. Um, uh, it's even even if it is important, even if there are improvements needed to the to the shelters, um, uh, the streets being the streets is not an acceptable alternative. Yeah, that and that's the bottom line of all of this. The shelters are intended to provide uh, some temporary, some viable temporary alternative, and these rules do. We'll discuss this further. They're counterproductive. Now, to be productive, at least for one minute, we're going to take a short break. Watch this. <laughs> Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo. John Newman, welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider, and we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha.
Aloha and welcome back to Community Matters here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Today we're talking about uh, some new state rules that have gone into effect that have adverse effect or could potentially have adverse effect on the number of beds in homeless shelters in the state. So we're calling it uh, a new law that you're going to hate. So we're here with Jay um, and also Curtis from Hawaiian Hope. Um, they do, uh, they work with a lot of the, the shelters uh, talking about this, uh, talking about this problem. Yeah, by the way, this bill was signed by the governor or not? What happened? Where's the, uh, you know, we got a homeless coordinator. We got some focus going on in homeless. It's one of the biggest problems the state has. So where's the administration on this bill? Uh, well, in terms of the, the status, this, uh, according to the, again, to the Wall Street Journal, this was allowed to take into effect. Uh, Governor Ige neither vetoed nor signed it. Mm. Okay. Well, that leaves us in sort of the netherland here, because we don't know how the administration feels that it passed, but... Um, well, I can, if I, I can interject, I can Yeah, tell please, you, interject. We want um, you to, that's why you're please, here. Please, yeah, tell, help <laughs> well, us understand the politics. Well, I don't, I don't know... I don't know the politics side of it, but I do know for a fact that the, the service providers um, said, don't do this. You know, they're on record. The shelter people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they, I mean, you know, come on. They, they, they know the net result. These are the guys who are providing the services. And so if you say that you're going to have to do this, this, and this, the first question is, okay, um, so how do we serve that many people and, and comply with these rules, right? Um, you know, b before we, I mean, if I can go to this um, before we took the break we'd mentioned about the the shelter you know not not uh, the one is going to close down yeah. right <clears throat> um, if, if I can lighthouse in Waipahu um, they did not apply for the renewal of their grants um, this was you know this was on the news um, yeah, was Bill Hummel right mm -hmm. Bill Hummel mm -hmm. is the shelters director down there um, you know and not only is he the shelters director but he's the MSW instructor at HPU. This guy knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about, right? He's, he is the expert, right? He's the instructor. Um, and he's, he's said there's no way to comply with all of these requirements. It's, you know, it's the 30 square feet thing. Um, on top of that, there's the requirements of toilets and a number of toilets and number of sinks per the number of people in the facility. And, and on top of that, it's a 90-day requirement to get the people through the system, hurry up, get them in, into permanent housing. It sounds like micro mismanagement to me. Mm. And we can't, they can't, so, you know, if, if the operators are going to tell you that, you know, we can't uh, do this. That, that you shouldn't do it, then you do it anyway. And then they wind up, you know, a guy like Hummel, totally committed, right, cares to the bottom of his boots about dealing with this problem, cares about the, the lighthouse and all the time and effort and, uh, you know, the, the guts that he put into making it work up to this point. Yeah, for and 10 he years. says, I'm Amazing. folding, I'm folding, boys, I'm out of here. That's how I feel about this new law. That really speaks volumes to me. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a speechless because, you know, he, so he's, he's one facility, um, but that one facility is a, a um, I don't, I'm not even sure the right word to use. It's, it's an incredibly important step because that's one of the few true emergency shelters, right, mm. where you can go and stay the same night. Mm. You can just... I mean, it's hard to go and stay the sa same night in other uh, yeah, shelters? Yeah. Um, you can't get in. Well... Waiting list, something. Some of them have waiting lists, right. Some of them have waiting lists. Some, they're not considered emergency shelters. They're considered transitional shelters. So you can't just go and show up and stay. You have to get on their list. You have to go through the paperwork, get the process, you know, da 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 um, You know, and like I said, we, I know for a fact that some of the shelters we work with, they have waiting lists that are months long. Um, and so, but Lighthouse was one of those facilities where you could walk in, stay the same night that you, that you showed up, you know, and okay, now what? I mean... Yeah, now, well, that's the question. We have a few minutes left for that discussion. So let me ask you, Raya, you, you know, what now? What do we do? I suppose I make you queen of Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, queen. Everybody like to be queen. What, what do you do? You have complete control of this statute, the regulations, the shelters, and you make commandments. Make some commandments for me. <laughs> <laughs> make some commandments. Well, I, um, 
uh, not being an expert on, a uh, state expert on homeless policy, I think I'll just back up a little bit and say, um, clearly, Hawaii does have the highest per capita incidence of, um, of homeless people. Um, this is not just a problem of, you know, the stereotypical sort of young guy on drugs who could be sort of getting his life together. There are elderly sick people. There are children and families. One third of all of the homeless are kids. One third, One third. is our <laughs> children. That, um, so there's an extremely serious problem. I know that uh, the state has chosen to sort of um, deal with this problem on an emergency basis, which allows it to sort of take brief, quick actions that can, you know, um, uh, you know, that can um, make it easier to be decisive. Uh, but it looks like we need to think about the money that we put towards this, this issue. Um, we need to take a really serious look at housing affordability. Um, uh, the integrated services that are provided for, um, for families, for people with mental health and other pressures, and do a little better than this, because it looks like we're going to need to have um, more emer you know, emergency housing for folks and, when it's already a crisis situation. So I think we need to take a good, strong look at how we can really provide more housing for people in the state. That would be my answer. If I was queen, that's what I would do. Excellent answer. Okay, Curtis, I'm making you king now, oh. or if you want to be prince, oh. you, can, you, can, you can be prince if you like. Um, well, what do you do with <laughs> this like, new wait. law just went into effect? It's, uh, it's um, not helping, <laughs> counterproductive. <laughs> uh, I think by that gesture you mean let's throw the thing out. Well, you know, I, okay, I'm, I'm all for improvement. I want to see people feel comfortable in the shelters. You know, we, there's a lot of stuff that obviously we can be improved at different levels, right? But when you go back to the, the base of it is when the shelter providers tell you this isn't going to work and you just ignore what they've said, you know, we really need to rethink that. Um, you it's know, a whole lot of thing. We'll say this is a, a sort of social infrastructure issue. I, I think part of the problem is that for a lot of the, and it's not just the homeless services, but a lot of different things that I see, the laws, the rules, and, and things like that, it's an all or nothing attitude. You know, there's no middle ground on, okay, well, we're gonna Im make this improvement, but maybe, you know, we only, because we've got this many single people in your shelter that, that are quite fine with where they're at, they're just happy to be, you know, under a roof. Um, you know, that maybe we can only have this apply to a portion of the facility, uh, you know, in, instead of an all or nothing, you know, and, and because the, the bottom line is, you know, we're constantly, constantly talking about we need to get the homeless off the street, into the shelters, you know, through the system. We got to, you know, go to the shelter. They don't like the rules. Well, okay, now even if they want to go, they can't. There's no space. We've just lost a third of the beds. One thing I read in the Wall Street Journal is that it's unclear how these new regulations are going to be implemented. So I don't know if that means that there could be some flexibility or not. Well, I hope there is some flexibility. I mean, speaking from the, the context of this conversation, somebody out there, maybe uh, Scott Morishigi, the homeless coordinator, ought to back up a little and take a look at this and try to hear, hear the various providers before he implements and maybe uh, maybe repeals or amends this well, thing so it becomes workable. I don't. Well, I, I want to come to Scott's defense just for a second. I'm not sure that it's totally under his control to to do that. Um, you know, while he may be the the. Well, he can only recommend. I agree. Right. You know, if this was a state law that was passed, right? And yeah. you know, so regardless even of what his recommendations are. Um, it's ultimately the legislature, and it's yeah. the committees in the legislature, and the committee chairs in the legislature. You right. Know, and, right who are going to have to do something about it. But the reality is, as you said, Raya, that we, we have the worst numbers in the country per capita. Um, and I'll, I'll add something else, too. To have the homeless in our community, especially in Honolulu, but all the islands, because we have high numbers on all the islands, um, is, is um, it's, it's shame, shame, shameful. And it undermines our society and it undermines the way we see each other and the way we see the community as a, you know, as a community. And, and every day that goes by, when we take either no steps or steps that are counterproductive like this one, uh, we're worse in it and our community is the worst for it. We as a community cannot afford to have mistakes like this. We have to be much more Akamai. And 
We have to put our money where our mouth is. I think I the idea there, of yeah. doing an unfunded liability like this is really bad news. It has to be changed. Yeah, that, that was one of the um, that was one of the uh, key things with the lighthouse is that they said even if they can comply with the other two requirements, um, they they can't. There was no money for actually providing the the physical upgrades to the building. Uh, you know, to to do the compliance. You know, in a program we had a couple of years ago, we, we looked at the underfunded liabilities in general around the state, and there are, by the count that we had at the time, 40 billion plus of unfunded liabilities where we didn't know where that money was going to come from. And part of that, part of that was dealing with the homeless issue. And my guess is that whatever number there was a couple of years ago to deal with the homeless issue, it's more now. There are more homeless. It's more expensive to deal with them. Mm. Um, and if people expect uh, us to build bathrooms and walls and reduce the number of uh, individuals in a given facility, it's more expensive yet. So we're, we're talking about billions. We're talking about billions of unfunded liability, and we're not bellying up to the issue at all. And it's about time we as a community and the legislature as a legislature got together and figured out how much money they're really willing to, to spend on this and what steps they're really willing to take because ultimately, over time, this is undermining our whole society. Okay, Raya, you get to close. Um, well, uh, that takes us to the end of another uh, Community Matters episode. Um, mahalo and aloha.